See how the people of God and the leader of the people of God coped in faith, not in any other way. How they coped in faith with the demands and with the difficulties of life. And we see also how they reacted and what their experiences were when, for a variety of reasons, they were adrift from God. And we see in the psalm sometimes very, very vividly how God dealt with his people when they had been drifting and backsliding to bring them back to himself and to service. And when we are adrift from God, when we get out of sorts with God, we cannot really be brought back to useful service unless we are brought back to God himself. And we see in a number of the Psalms that the disciplinary process by which God brought his people back to himself sometimes took a long time. And it took a long time not because God was unwilling. One of the glories of the gospel is that God is always willing to take us back. Isn't it marvelous? I wonder sometimes if he's really wise and always taking us back because we blunder so much. But he's the God who is always willing to take us back. And he takes us back. And he trusts us when often we are not very willing to trust ourselves. But the process, the disciplinary process of bringing us back to God sometimes takes a long time. Not because God is unwilling, but because the grace of repentance and the grace of humility have to be worked in our hearts. And such comments on the psalm by way of introduction should remind us, for example, of, of some of the passages in the New Testament, not least in the epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 12, beginning at verse 5, where it says, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor lose courage when you are punished or disciplined by him. For the Lord disciplines him whom he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. And the whole process of his discipline to work in us the grace of repentance and to establish the grace of humility may be painful. But as that passage goes on to say, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And, of course, not all learn wisely and well from the disciplines of God. Because sometimes we resent the disciplines of God. And sometimes we resent the people or the channels by which the discipline of God operates in our lives. But always behind it all, there is the grace of God that is seeking to bring us back to himself so that being once again in fellowship with him, we can serve him rightly. The other passage in the New Testament that I had noted here in my bit of paper was in the passage that Robert T. Logan asked me to read in the service this morning in Acts chapter 14 and verse 22 where it says, we have to learn that we must, through much tribulation, enter the kingdom. And so, in by way of that introduction, we come to Psalm number 20. And you will see in the very first part of the first verse that we are dealing with a day of trouble. 
Thing, things are not easy, things are not peaceful. The man of God and the people of God are facing a day of trouble. The commentators tell me that Psalms 20 and 21 belong together. And Psalm 20 is the psalm before the battle and Psalm 21 is the psalm for after the battle. That means Psalm 20 is really prayer and Psalm 21 is praise. Now it is obvious from the psalm, it's a very short one but the language is quite vivid, it is obvious that David the king and his people are facing a battle and the enemy is very powerful. The situation then concerns the people of God and the work of God and the enemy of God's work. And therefore, if we are to understand this psalm rightly, we have to see it or set it in the context of spiritual warfare. And it is really quite amazing. No matter how long we've been walking the Christian way, no matter how long we've been under the ministry of God's Word, it is amazing how in the hassle and the difficulties and pressure and the demands of life, how quickly we forget, as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, that we wrestle not against mere flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the world rulers of this darkness. World rulers that are far more significant, far more powerful and far more frightening than, than the visible national rulers we see throughout the whole wide world just now. As the people of God... We are involved in spiritual warfare. We do not wrestle or fight against mere flesh and blood, although that is how it appears. We, we very seldom are aware that we are looking at the devil. We are usually looking either at situations or at people. But we wrestle not against flesh and blood. It may appear that it's a human situation and human activity. And of course we have to recognize that people, even Christians, can do devil's work. Never forget that it was to one of his much-loved disciples, Peter by name, that Jesus had to say in a certain situation relating to the work of God, Get behind me, Satan. He said that to Peter because Peter was not doing God's work. Peter was not exercising influence for the good of God's work and God's people. He was doing devil's work. And I find that very, very disturbing, that a man living in such close company with Jesus could be so deceived that he ended up doing devil's work. And I think he was by and large deceived by his own spiritual complacency. He assumed that he understood spiritually and that he could see clearly spiritually, but he was so centered upon himself that he ended up doing devil's work. And so we set this psalm in the context of spiritual warfare. And we must not ever be surprised when we find ourselves in conflict. And here in the psalm, it is not David in isolation. It is David as the leader of God's people and God's work at a certain time in the course of history in a certain geographical situation. 
And therefore this psalm is really not a personal psalm. It is not a personal issue or a personal struggle. It is a psalm of David in which he cry, he and his people cry to God in relation to the work of God. And in verses 1, to, the, psalm div, the psalm divides, it's so it would seem, into verses 1 to 5, and then some people say verses 6, 7, and 8, and then verse 9, that's three sections. Some people say verses 1 to 5, then verse 6 standing on its own, and then verses 7, 8, and 9, but we don't need to be too clinical about it. But what we do need to notice in the first five verses is the significant starting point in this situation of a day of trouble facing a powerful enemy. Aware as they were of the seriousness of the situation, they prayed. Some of you may be saying, oh, not another sermon about prayer. Yes. Because it is a lesson in, in the realm of individual Christian life and discipleship and in the realm of the life of the church that we are immensely slow to learn. They prayed. They went directly to God and their appeal was addressed to God. And this as I think, is the lesson for ourselves and for our work. Before trying to deal with a situation, now notice, before trying to deal with a situation, before committing ourselves to practical efforts in dealing with the situation, Go to God in prayer. Before speaking to people, before even speaking to your nearest and dearest, go to God in prayer, but very soon take your nearest and dearest with you to God in prayer. Because if you can't do that, there is something wrong in the relationship between you and your nearest and dearest. Go to God in prayer. And you will find, I think, as David so often find, found, that going in situations of difficulty, in days of trouble, in going directly to God in prayer, you find that this calms your feelings and clears your thinking. Because when we're in the presence of God and dealing with God, we tend not to get steamed up. Go to God in prayer. And never let the urgency of the situation, and this was a very urgent situation, never let the urgency of the situation Prevent prayer. Because if we allow that to happen, the tendency is that we shall begin, whether consciously or subconsciously, to put our trust in other things rather than in God. And there is a great danger here in the whole realm of evangelicalism nowadays that there is a tendency, we, we see the situation. We, we see the need for the preaching of the gospel. We, need the, we see the need for this and that and the other. We see the dangers. And the tendency is that we address ourselves to the situation on the basis of methodology. You know, applying business methods to the work of the kingdom which is really a disastrous process. We put our trust in methodology and techniques and organization and in manipulation. But then you see, my friends, we need to remember, and I'm preaching it myself as much as to you, and I hope you're listening as much as I'm listening to the sermon. 
Because, you see, in some ways, I'm responsible for you unto God. And that's no easy responsibility. And I'm very aware of it. We need to remind ourselves, as Paul states for us so clearly in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4, we're not turning up references tonight, that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, not fleshly, because such weapons are no use in spiritual warfare. And this is why we need to learn to pray. Whether it is evangelism or church building or social problems or political problems or pastoral care or whether it is deep-seated personal problems and family problems, the place to start and the place to continue is the place of prayer. Now I and others are fully aware of the fact that down through the years we have often been criticized by those who are ardent, as they would call it, for evangelism. We've been criticized on the basis saying of us that we do nothing. I refuse the charge because if there is one thing that we are at least beginning to learn in this congregation, it is the importance and the centrality and the priority of the place of prayer. And that's where this psalm begins. Now I want you to look at these verses in the psalm, verses 1 to 5, and notice that this is not a private or a personal prayer. It is the corporate prayer of the people of God. It's not David who's praying really in verses 1 to 5, it's the congregation. Well, I'm quite sure that David joined in in the prayer. But this is, this is not private or personal prayer, although, of course, private and personal prayer is very, very important because private prayer and corporate prayer go together. And in a very real sense, although they're facing a day of trouble, this is not really what I would call crisis prayer, Although, if in some sense it is crisis prayer, we need to remember that crisis prayer is married to personal prayer, just as corporate prayer and personal prayer are married together. And I took the trouble in my preparation, and I did it again this afternoon to look up the story in the book of Daniel, the sixth chapter, verse 10. Remember when Daniel was facing, was it the lion's den? Because the edict had gone out from the king that no one should pray to their God or pray only to Nebuchadnezzar's God. L listen to this. Daniel chapter 6 and verse 10. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. Oh, what a picture that is of a man's devotional life. Jerusalem, of course, was out of sight. Far, far out of sight. But oh, how often Daniel with his open window would look, over there, the city of my God, over there. And he got down upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God. Now these important words, as he had done previously. The crisis, you see, didn't require Daniel to change the pattern of his devotional life or his prayer life one little bit. 
And that is how we have to learn to live. And here in our Psalm number 20 in the first five verses, what we have to see is the people of God identified with and standing with their leader, their king, and their shepherd. And David, of course, was all three, leader, king, and shepherd. And the people visibly, with their full consent, stood with him, and they pray in unison for David. The Lord answer you in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and support from Zion. May he remember, may he... Can you imagine the effect that that must have had on David, the leader of the people and of the work? As he became aware that he was, a, that he was literally surrounded by his people who with one accord were lifting up him and his cause in prayer to the throne of God. I found these verses very, very moving. I must confess that when, my, when I first read over the psalm early in the week, my reaction was to see in these verses, or perhaps I ought to say to imagine in these verses, the priest or the high priest of Israel standing in the presence of God on the basis of sacrifice for sin. That's verse 3. Making intercession for the man of God and the people of God and the work of God. And I sat at my desk and I lot with my Bible open in front of me and I allowed, I believe, the Spirit of God to minister to my own mind and heart by thinking of Jesus. The one who, according to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24, now appears in the presence of God on our behalf. Our advocate, our great high priest, pleading our cause. Now, I don't want to read into the psalm what may not be there. But I think we have to remember that when we are presenting our prayers and our intercessions to God, it is on the basis of the finished work, the sacrificial atoning death of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, our Savior. And we need to remember, oh, my dear people, remember this when you're saying your prayers at bedtime tonight or tomorrow morning or whenever you say your prayers. Remember this. Not only that, he, that we have one who intercedes in our behalf, but remember this, that Christ is with us in our praying. And he takes our, our poor, imperfect petitions and intercessions and he presents them in perfect form at the throne of God. Sometimes in, in this debates and discussions in pres the Presbytery of Glasgow, we come to a situation where perhaps we want to overture the General Assembly. And there are various motions and amendments and all that before presbytery are getting carried and approved. And there comes a point sometimes where the presbytery clerk says, the, the matter having been approved and we're going to appeal to the General Assembly with regard to this matter. And the clerk says, it will presbytery grant me the, per the permission and the authority to put this overture into the right form of words to be presented 
at the General Assembly. Because you know how things can, a, can appear at a higher court and be ruled out of order on some kind of verbal or legal technicality. And we always give the presbytery clerk the authority. Oh yes, you, you put it into the right words. And then when it goes to the General Assembly, it'll be right and ready to be received. Now, my friends, that's what happens to our prayers. Our poor, stumbling prayers. What, what an encouragement to pray. He takes our prayers. In a sense, he rewrites them. Doesn't change the requests. Nor the, nor the, the word, the praise. But he, he rewrites them. And presents them. Look, look what they prayed for David. The Lord answer you in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob protect you. Then in verses 2, 3 and 4, the repetition of he, he, he. Do you, do you see how God emphasizing it is? And then in verse 5, really before they get to the end of that prayer, they're really saying, Ah, oh, but David, we're, we're not going to be left out. May we shout for joy over your victory and in the name of our God set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. If you look at verses 4 and 5, it speaks of your heart's desire. I tried to quote this, didn't get the words quite right in our prayer. Hast thou not seen how thy heart's wishes have been granted in what he ordained? Things not working out quite the way that you asked. Things not working out quite the way that you hoped or expected. But then you look back and you think, Oh God, you, you've done it right again. Your heart's desire. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. But notice, notice the emphasis right at the beginning of the psalm in verse 1. The name of the God of Jacob. Not the God of Abraham. Ah, we, we feel a bit, a bit left out when we begin to talk about the God of Abraham. The man who was the friend of God. Oh, what a man of stature. Oh, oh, we could understand God listening to Abraham as Abraham stood in intercession before God. But, oh, we say, Lord, we're, we're not that caliber. The God of Jacob. Don't ever forget the Bible phrase, Fear not thou worm, Jacob. Aren't you glad it says, The God of Jacob, The name of the God of Jacob, Protect you. The God of the weak, The needy, The uncertain, And the complicated, Oh, you say, preacher, you're on target tonight. I'm, I'm such a complicated character, so am I. But we have the God of Jacob. Oh, you've heard me saying this till you're weary of it, but I'm away back in thought to the night, the very first Sunday of my ministry here, when my brother preached an afternoon communion service on the text. Blessed is the man who has the God of Jacob for his help. May the God, the name of the God of Jacob help you. May he send you help from the sanctuary, that is from his presence, and give you support from Zion. I wonder if I just referred in passing to the last verse of the first chapter of Hebrews. I wonder how many of you would know what I was talking about. It talks about the angels of God ministering spirits sent forth from the presence of God to minister. The word is really the word deacon, that is, to do hard work on behalf of the heirs of salvation. 
the days the days are long past very long past when ministers and manses used to have servants ah but you see we all still have servants it's a marvelous verse you know wonder if I could quote it accurately for you listen to this speaking of of the angels of God are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to serve for the sake of those who are to obtain salvation oh my dear people what a backing we've got down through the psalm he you we fellowship and service think think of those who have gone out from this congregation and service we are in it together the trilogans know that they know that they are not apart from us though they're in thailand after their furlough and we are here we are in it together and we're in it together most of all in prayer and sometimes we think that our prayers are very weak i came across a comment in two different commentaries i don't know which of the men we spoke the original words but trying to encourage us, us in prayer the commentator said a whisper can start an avalanche my word mind you it means we need to be careful when we are saying our prayers because god is of our mind to act to answer and so we come to verse 6 and we hurry to a close and in verse 6 we we really have the theme of answered prayer and it seems here that david speaks he has been with his people as they have prayed oh i i know a little bit about this sometimes on a saturday evening when we've been praying perhaps for the best part of an hour there can come upon my mind and heart and spirit a great assurance with regard to sunday not that i presume But oh there seems to be a god given assurance that the blessing of heaven will rest upon us on the coming day I felt it last night and I know it today I felt it last saturday and the saturday before and would you not say that over these past few weekends here in god's house there has been something significant about our awareness of god's presence and god's blessing and in verse 6 david speaks assured of victory now i know that the lord will help his anointed he will answer him from his holy heaven with mighty victories by his right hand and in that verse we see of course that david is very aware of the fact that he is the lord's anointed that god has laid his hand upon him and and that is both a thrilling and a sobering awareness and he is conscious also that heaven is alerted and heaven is active shall we say in answer to the prayers of his people but of course heaven is awake and heaven is alert and heaven is aware before we even begin to pray and i believe it right to say on the basis of some verses from daniel chapters 9 and 10 i believe it is right to say that prayer is answered as soon as it is prayed Yes, I've been reading quite a bit of my Bible by way of preparation. It does me good. In Daniel chapter 9 at verse 23, this is what I read. If I can find it. Yes. God is speaking to Daniel and says, 
at the beginning of your supplications, a word went forth, and I have come to tell it to you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. And again in chapter 10 and verse 12, Then God said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your mind to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. And then it goes on to speak of the prince of the kingdom of Persia, withstanding the very angel of God for a season. Yes, you see, we're back to the principalities and powers and mighty spiritual conflict behind the human situation. But prayer is heard and prayer is answered as soon as it is prayed, even though the visible practical effect may take time. Verses 6, 7, and 8 are possibly belonging together and possibly all spoken by David and he speaks for all the people. And of course that is part of leadership. And a true leader when he speaks on behalf of the people should be a means of grace to the people. I'm thinking of some of the wartime speeches of Winston Churchill. We will never surrender. And on another occasion, and the words are in our church hymnary, yes, he says, face, face up to all the battles and the apparent slow progress, but westward look, the land is bright. And you could almost feel the heart of the nation throbbing in hope and expectation. Sorry so many of you are far too young to remember about it. Now I know that the Lord will help his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with mighty victories by his right hand. Some boast of chariots and some of horses, but we boast in the name of the Lord our God. I wonder if David was thinking back many, many years to when he was a young lad facing the giant Goliath. When he said, remember First Samuel 17 to Goliath, You come to me, you come against me with sword and with javelin, but I come in the name of the Lord. What's in a name? Oh, it depends on the name, of course. But all of God is in his name. I turned up my old redemption hymn book, Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will joy and comfort give you. Take it then, where'er you go. Take the name of Jesus ever as a shield from every snare. If temptations round you gather, breathe that holy name in prayer. Oh, the precious name of Jesus, how it thrills our souls with joy when his loving arms receive us and his songs our tongues employ. There is a name I love to hear, I love to to sing its worth, it sounds like music in mine ears, the sweetest name on earth, the gentle name of my Saviour, who forgives and heals me in all my many, many needs, and yet the strong name of Jesus, in whom I can trust. Oh, perhaps David was thinking of the story of the redemption of the people from out of Egypt when Pharaoh's horses and chariots followed the children of Israel into the Red Sea and they were overwhelmed. Oh, says David, we've seen it all before. We know we have a God who hears and answers our prayers and works deliverance for his people. 
we boast in the name of the Lord our God. They, oh, here is a principle that we can count on. They will collapse and fall. That's why we should never be afraid of evil. Never. Nor, not even when we seem to be faced with all the ramifications of evil. They will fall. But we shall rise and stand upright. That's what it says in Psalm number one. The wicked will not stand. That's what it says in Psalm number 73. Then I understood their end. That's what it says in Psalm 147 that we sang, if I remember rightly, last Sunday evening. The Lord upholds the meek and casts the wicked to the ground. Verse 9, and we're finished. Give victory to the King, O Lord. Answer us when we call. One commentator suggests that the best comment in verse 9 is simply the phrase, God save the King. But there seems in this last verse, at least to my mind and heart, an appeal to a king beyond an earthly king. Give victory to the king. Ah, says God, it's all right. I've given him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow. Things in heaven, things on earth, things under the earth. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If we had not sung Psalm number 46 just the other week, we would have sung it to finish our service tonight. God is our refuge and our strength in straits of present aid. Therefore, although the earth remove, we will not be afraid. And the end of that psalm, oh, it says, the Lord of hosts is with us. And then it says, the God of Jacob is our refuge. Oh, my dear, dear people, what a God to trust in. Let's sing about that as we close our